Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl, and I'm speaking to you from lovely corporate headquarters here in Niles, Illinois at Shure. And today we're going to be talking about microphone techniques for mobile device recording. But before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. First of all, this webinar will be archived, as they always are. We are recording it for posterity. And you can always go visit our blog or Shure.com slash training to get a list of all of those webinars. Um, you can go back through if you miss some information or if you want to direct a colleague or a friend to this information. There's just all sorts of great learning on a wide variety of topics um, from basics to, you know, in-depth technical things. So so please feel free to peruse. There's a lot of great knowledge there. I know I learn a lot from that website, so you should too. Um, and that is usually available about the week after. So sometime early next week, this archive webinar will be available online. But in the meantime, for those of you here, um, the second item of note is that if you have any questions, we will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the session. Um, in the right-hand corner of your screen, you should see the little navigation pane, and in there, there will be a question section. That's where you can type in your questions. Um, if you don't see it, uh, just look for the little orange box with the white arrow in it and click on that, and that'll maximize that pane so you can get to that question thing. So please feel free to enter any questions you have as we go along, and we will get to those at the end of the session. So so without further ado, I'm going to throw it over to my friend Gino Sismondi, and we are joined today by Thomas Banks, and they're going to be giving us all the info about microphone techniques for mobile work, mobile device recording. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, thanks Cheryl. Yeah, thanks for being here, Thomas. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, so uh, it, those of you who registered for this webinar in advance, which is probably all of you because you have to register in advance, you may have noticed a slight tweak to the title here, which uh, includes the word device, because we realize mobile recording could encompass, encompass a lot of different applications. Um, but we're particularly, particularly interested here about what microphone techniques do you need to know, what things do you need to keep in mind when you are uh, using a, a non-traditional device uh, to to capture that signal from the microphone, meaning you know everyone's walking around with uh, what what could be considered a recording studio in your pocket these days, um, and that's the kind of things we want to address here, um, because you know <laughs> it doesn't matter what what that device in your pocket is capable of, you still have to capture the um, the analog. Uh, waveform correctly in order for it to sound good. And that's kind of some of the things we want to go through here uh, today. So specifically, what are we going to talk about? What are, what are the things that you need to know? And, you know, it's not much different than, you know, any other recording you might try to do, which is, number one, where are you recording? Number two, what are you recording with, the actual device? And number three, what are you recording? Or another way of saying that might be, what's the application, right? Um, you know, there are all kinds of things you could possibly record, and the microphone that you choose and the techniques you employ may differ depending on, uh, again, what that what that happens to be here. So those are the things we want to we wanna keep in mind here as we go through. And let's start. We start on purpose with where are you recording because this is probably one of the most misunderstood variables but probably the single biggest thing besides or maybe even before the microphone that can influence the sound of what you ultimately end up capturing. And you know, I chose these two images uh, here sort of on purpose to really kind of drive that point home. You know, in the days when recording technology was super expensive and you had to go to a professional recording studio to record anything, um, not only were you paying for the equipment and the ex expensive, expansive microphone collection and the knowledgeable, uh, trained sound engineer to help capture that sound, you were also paying for a very nice sounding room in which to record, uh, as evidenced by the picture on the left there. Uh, obviously, with the advent of digital recording, the, the price of entry has gone way down in terms of getting the equipment that you need, and you can buy some very nice equipment and some very nice microphones for not a whole heck of a lot of money anymore, but then you take it to your studio loft apartment, uh, which maybe is an old you know converted... Um, warehouse of some sort with you know bare walls and lots of reflective surfaces and then you think to yourself huh this doesn't quite sound like I was expecting it to and that's really because the room has such a huge um, huge influence on what you end up sounding or hearing and to kind of drive that point home um, this is the the part of the presentation where we actually did get some recorded samples in here that I think help illustrate that so what I was, uh, what I did last week is I dragged Cheryl around the building and I made her uh, made her sing in multiple different locations using the same microphone in the same place. So uh, in the case here, the audio samples we're going to listen to were all made using the 
uh, Shure Motive MV88 stereo microphone. Uh, held, were directly plugged into my iPhone and held probably about 18 inches or so from Cheryl's mouth. And then had her sing the same thing over and over again. So the only variable that really changed here is the room. So the first sample we're going to hear was recorded uh, in my office, which most of you probably haven't seen my office. It's basically uh, three or two bare walls, uh, kind of concrete walls, and uh, two glass surfaces, and a concrete ceiling, very high ceiling, and air handling noise that is about as bad as it could possibly get. So let's let's take a listen to what that sounds like. Lord. Won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. All right, so that 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 sounded uh, well like you would expect in a noisy office, right? So we had a good microphone uh, recording on a device that it was meant to go with, but it still doesn't sound so great. And that's a very common call we would get from people. It's like, yeah, it sounds like I'm in the in a wind tunnel or I'm in a tin can. And what's wrong with this microphone? Well, there's nothing wrong with the microphone. It's the room. So as a contrast, here's the same. Um, uh, track sort of recorded in uh, well actually in the room where we're doing this webinar right now but we did this last week again same microphone same place lord won't you buy me a mercedes benz my friends all drive porsches i must make amens Hopefully that was obvious to everyone. I think it should uh, be pretty clear how different that sounds. And again, that's all that changed there was the room. So we went into a room that is uh, basically acoustic absorptive material on three of the walls with a drop acoustical tile ceiling and not as much air handling noise. And that made a that made a, a big difference. And then just one more example there to kind of further drive that point home. We went into uh, uh, an isolation booth in our recording studio here at Shure. So this was probably the, the quietest room in the entire building. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Okay, so there's, again, three examples where that's all that changed was the room. Same mic, same position, um, and vast difference in the quality you can get. So you always want to think about that when you're making your recordings and what can you do to optimize the room there. Um, now, obviously, not everybody has the ability to go into a, you know, acoustically uh, designed professional studio to make your recordings in. So what do you do? Well, the number one thing that you do in this first kind of mic technique we're going to talk about, we say this in just about every webinar we do on mic techniques, is get the microphone as close as possible to the sound source, right? And that's due to something that we call critical distance. Critical distance is the point of the room where the direct sound from what you're trying to capture is equal to all of the noise and reverberation in the room. So the direct sound, the intensity of it, drops off by about 6 dB every time you double the distance between the microphone and the sound source. And so that means the further away the microphone is from the sound source, the less direct sound you're picking up. And then, you know, Conversely, you're picking up more noise and reverberation in the room. So you always want the microphone at a minimum to be inside that critical distance or else you're going to be picking up mostly room noise. And the noisier the room is, like my office, obviously the shorter the critical distance is going to be. What that really means is that you just want to get the microphone as close as possible to your sound source. Now, in a noisy room like my office, um, you may not be able to get it close enough or you'd have to get it so close that a microphone like the MV88, a sensitive condenser mic, wouldn't be your best choice if you have to to put your lips right on the thing, right? So you, the, the type of microphone you're using also comes into play there. Um, but again, you, you really need to think about that uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, where, where you place the microphone. So if the, room, the, the less ideal the room is, the closer the microphone has to be to the sound source, so that way you don't pick up as much of that room noise. But again, the room is, is, is such an important piece there. Um, now, the other um, important piece to keep in mind, too, is that the microphone itself makes makes a big difference, right? Um, you have to think about, of course, what kind of device you're recording to. There's pros and cons to both using your your phone or your tablet to record versus maybe using a laptop or something like that. Uh, and that also influences the kind of microphone that you end up choosing. And we'll talk a little bit about the connectivity issues in a minute here. But one of the things I wanted to bring home just with a, with a couple more audio samples here is that the less ideal the environment is, the more important having a good microphone makes. So what I'll do here is I'll compare using the MV88 microphone to uh, the built-in microphone on an iPhone. And first of all, just to kind of um, 
let you hear it again one more time. I'll play the isolation booth recording with the MV88 and then the isolation booth recording with the built-in uh, iPhone microphone. So here's the isolation booth. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. And now to contrast that, let's listen in the same room, the isolation booth, but using the iPhone's microphone uh, at the same distance. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. You can hear a difference there, and, you know, that's a serviceable recording, and it probably would work if you if you needed it to. But again, we're in a, the best room that we could possibly find to make a recording in. So to, make, to contrast that, we went outside. Um, and let's take a listen to the built-in iPhone microphone outdoors, standing right outside Sure Headquarters. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. And now we'll contrast that with the MV88 in the same location outdoors. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. So in this case, we could hear, I think, pretty clearly that, you know, using a better microphone can help sometimes overcome uh, a less than ideal environment. So, uh, and there was less, less traffic noise, less pickup of strange reverberation happening because of where we were standing close to the building and all of that sort of a thing. So that, that makes, a, makes a difference there in terms of the sound quality. And I probably should have mentioned before, I didn't think about it, but um, uh, uh, listening to this webinar with headphones probably would have uh, been a good thing to recommend to people. But we will archive this if you'd like to go back later and, and hear those recordings through headphones so you can get a better idea of the differences there. So, but the other reason the device, uh, you have to consider the device you're recording to is you have to consider how you're going to interface the microphone to the, devo to the device. And this is a call uh, that we get here a lot in technical support at Sure, as, again, more types of devices come out onto the market that people can, uh, you know, use to record too. They know they need a better microphone and they want to go to the store and buy a professional microphone and they buy something that has this gigantic round three-prong connector on it with a professional microphone cable and then they look at the input of their device and they think, huh, how am I going to make this work? And generally, it doesn't work well unless you use the correct interface. In other words, professional microphones are not designed to interface directly with consumer devices. So you you run into some some issues there you have to be aware of. And um, trying to keep this webinar to, to move along, we don't want to get bogged down into just too many discussions on signal level impedance and cable wiring, but just suffice to say that you need to you need to get an interface to try and get into your device digitally if at all possible. Even a computer may have something that is labeled audio input or microphone input on it, but those are really designed for consumer-type devices and really inexpensive microphones that you might buy at an electronics store like you know Best Buy or something like that. Um, and they aren't really designed to deal with the signal level and impedance and, and wiring configuration of professional microphones. So generally, you're just going to have a lot of problems if you're trying to go into the audio in on your computer or the, the headphone slash mic jack on a phone or something like that. You're better off just avoiding those altogether and going directly digital, if at all possible. So on a computer, that means going into the USB jacks. Uh, on an iPhone or an iPad, that means getting into the lightning connector um, and you know something like that. So how are you going to do that? Well, there's really two ways you can do it. Through an adapter that takes the analog signal from your microphone and makes it digital, or through a microphone that has all of that uh, all of that stuff directly um, built into it, and we kind of see two two sort of examples of that here. Um, anything you would think that people would particularly want to look for in an interface that's useful for that sort of a thing? Um, yeah, well, just to go back, one reason, again, to avoid the eighth-inch input, I'd say, is because you're leaving the analog to digital conversion up to the manufacturer of the laptop desktop, and that's generally an afterthought, and it's a very narrow bandwidth speech sort of uh, cheap analog to digital converter. Mm. So if you're going to use an off-board device or an off-board digital ADC, you're probably going to 
there's probably more thought put into the analog to digital conversion than there is on the offboard unit than there is on the onboard. That's a good point. Great. Okay. As many inputs as possible, I would say, or you know, <laughs> as, as on your on your offboard. Um, you know, like I, the MVI, for instance, the reason we put a quarter inch and a XLR on that is because you just you doubled the number of devices you can put through that. Good. Rather, so you might take an instrument direct versus using a microphone or something like right. that. Okay, good point. Another key thing that I like to look for on these devices too is a headphone jack for um, for monitoring purposes. Because if you're doing any kind of recording that requires you to uh, layer multiple tracks, so in other words, you record something, you want to listen back to that and record something else on top of that, you need the ability to monitor the signal coming back from the computer previously recorded in perfect sync with the input signal going through it. So an interface or a microphone, uh, like a USB microphone that has that headphone jack built onto it, uh, eliminates that sort of latency issue. If you are going through one of these types of interfaces or microphones but monitoring off the headphone jack on your computer uh, or the headphone jack on your phone maybe, then you, you run into an issue of latency, which is the, the A to D and D to A and other processing that happens inside the device adds latency or delay to the signal, and then you hear that coming back and you can't stay in sync with what you're trying to previously record. So that can be a really, uh, really helpful thing to look for as well. Now, these solutions work great if you're trying to do basically one track of recording at a time. Maybe it's podcasting. Or maybe you're a solo singer-songwriter, so you, you, know, you play a track, and then you sing a track, and then maybe you double the vocal track, but you're doing it all one at a time. Uh, if you're recording a band um, or a large panel discussion or something that requires multiple microphones, then you need to look for a device that has multiple inputs on it here. And these are just a couple examples of the types of interfaces that have um, multiple mic and analog microphone inputs on them that then convert it to a digital signal that can connect to a computer via USB, or Firewire, or something like that. Um, again, uh, these are all, the point here is that it's all outboard. You're not trying to use, uh, you're, you're taking the input of the device, whatever analog input the device might have, out of the equation and digitizing the signal outside of the box and then bringing it in. So that's what we recommend there. So uh, now I want to talk about, you know, most importantly, what is it you're recording? And we're going to look at some um, specific applications and things you might have to keep in mind there, uh, particularly, again, some of the most common things that are done with mobile devices um, would be either just the speaking voice, podcasting, interview, et cetera, whatever that might happen to be, uh, and then singing, you know, vocal recording. And then in the musical side of things, maybe an ensemble recording like, uh, you know, a, a small bluegrass group or a, a choir concert or a chamber string ensemble, something like that, as well as solar instruments. You know, maybe you're making a demo at home or something like that of your songs, and, you know, you just want to record one instrument at a time. And then, of course, field recording. If you have a battery-powered mobile device um, that can record, high-quality audio, that's kind of a perfect application for that. So before that, it's worth um, just uh, for those who may be unfamiliar with these topics in the audience, um, going over some of the basic microphone principles that apply whether no matter what you're recording into or what type of microphone you happen to be using. And that's the operating principle of the microphone, the polar pattern of the microphone, and the frequency response. So again, the operating principle is how a microphone does what it does. Remember, a microphone uh, has, has one job, and that's to convert the uh, m motion of air molecules and waveform that we hear as sound into an electrical signal. And uh, there are many different ways this can be done. In modern applications, we're looking primarily at either the dynamic microphone or the condenser microphone, although ribbon mics are starting to make a strong comeback. But let's just uh, keep it uh, to the dynamic and the condenser type of microphones here. Dynamic microphone is a very, very simple device. Um, it's uh, a, an, a very inexpensive, or I should say a more affordable of the two choices between dynamic and uh, condenser. Here you see pictures of two somewhat famous uh, dynamic microphones. But looking inside, you get kind of a better idea of what's going on. Uh, one of the reasons dynamic microphones can be are, are so uh, inexpensive generally is because of what a simple device they are. 
in a dynamic microphone, you have a diaphragm, which is um, usually a thin layer of mylar with a coil of wire attached to the back of it, and then that coil of wire is suspended in a magnetic field. And as the sound waves strike the microphone uh, diaphragm, the diaphragm moves back and forth, which of course also moves that voice coil. And when you move the coil of wire in a magnetic field, through the properties of induction, a varying voltage is induced, current is induced on those wires. And along with that, the varying voltage is the um, output signal that then gets you know, sent on to the rest of your audio system, whether that's uh, going through an analog to digital converter into your phone or going into a PA system or whatever. So that's basically how it works. So they're very simple, very inexpensive. They sound pretty good. Um, some of the limitations, of course, is the size. The uh, dynamic cartridge can only be made so small before the sound quality kind of starts to suffer, so they're somewhat larger in size. Um, and there's a limitation to the frequency response because of the mass involved in that coil of wire. It's in, it's nearly impossible, I'll say it's totally impossible, but it's pretty hard to get a really flat, neutral, uncolored frequency response. Again, not that dynamic mics sound bad by any stretch, but there's just there's just some limitations there. But again, upsides, uh, very environmentally rugged, again, somewhat uh, relatively more affordable, and impossible to overload. A human being can't create enough sound pressure level to cause distortion within a dynamic microphone. So there's all kinds of positives there. Condenser microphones have come a long way. Um, traditionally, they were known as being somewhat delicate and sensitive and things that you didn't want to take out into the, into the field because you might damage them. But the last 20 or 30 years of microphone development, um, particularly with the advent of electric condenser microphones, has really made them uh, somewhat more uh, reliable to use in a variety of applications. When you're looking at a condenser microphone uh, element here, um, it's a much more precise sort of complex design. Uh, it doesn't maybe look like it from the, from the drawing here, but here we're just kind of looking at the basic parts of the element itself, where you've got a, a, a diaphragm that is uh, coated in metal, usually like a gold layered or gold sputtered type of covering on the diaphragm itself, and then an electrically charged backplate with some spacers to keep those two things separated. And in this case, when the sound waves strike the diaphragm and make it move back and forth, the actual spacing uh, between the, the diaphragm and the backplate changes, and uh, sort of d disturbing that electrical field is what causes the uh, signal that is the, the electronic signal that is then used um, to the output of the microphone. But because the, uh, the impedance of a condenser element tends to be very high and the output somewhat weak, there are additional electronics involved, referred to as the preamp, uh, in a condenser mic design, and those things are required in order for the microphone to do its job. Uh, if you are uh, thinking about using a condenser microphone and connecting it to an interface of some sort, then for connection to your mobile device, you want to make sure that that interface has phantom power available in it. Uh, that phantom power, of course, is a voltage that is supplied to the microphone to make sure that it uh, works. If you're using a digital microphone or USB microphone that is a condenser, it probably already has the power it needs um, uh, to make sure the microphone works. But again, when you're going through an interface, it's important to look for that phantom power. But condenser microphones can be more sensitive because there's less mass involved and have flatter, wider, generally more natural frequency response, which is all good. They are somewhat more um, environmentally uh, sensitive, maybe. You wouldn't uh, want to use it if you're outside um, doing a news report on a hurricane. Um, but uh, they, uh, they've gotten a lot more rugged, again, than um, some people uh, may have realized. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is because of the electronics involved in the preamp circuitry, uh, condenser microphones can be more easily overloaded than a dynamic microphone can. So you do want to pay attention to uh, the distance to the sound source and the, the sound level coming off that sound source to make sure that you're not getting distortion within the microphone uh, itself. Some condenser microphones have built-in pads and other circuitry you can use to help compensate for that, but it is something to be aware of. Next, we need to talk about the directional response of the microphones. Um, microphones can be generally broken down into two types of directionality, either omnidirectional, which means pick up from all sides like we see here, or some sort of unidirectional characteristic. Um, again, uh, omni, as you see, means it picks up sound from all directions. There is, it doesn't matter really which way you point the microphone, you will get decent sound pickup, uh, which can be useful in certain applications, particularly lavalier microphones where you have to clip that mic somewhere on the clothing, on the body. Body. It may not be uh, the uh, ideal location, but you've got to deal with what you've got. 
uh, in a lot of applications, particularly noisy applications, to come back to how the room influences the sound of what you're picking up again, it may be more desirable to use a unidirectional type of microphone. Here we're seeing the cardioid pattern response, so-called because the uh, pattern of the mic resembles a cardioid pickup pattern there, like a heart shape, I guess, is where the cardioid comes from. Uh, and again, the this is useful because now you can aim the microphone at the desired sound source and away from the undesired sound source. So again, in a noisier environment, getting that microphone in close and keeping it pointed at the sound source reduces that, uh, that pickup that you get of uh, extraneous sounds that you may not want. Something to keep in mind, again, on the car, on all directional microphones is that as you get closer to the sound source, the uh, the bass response of the microphone increases. The, ba the output of low frequencies um, is more dramatic, and as you get closer, that only increases. So you sometimes have to watch your distance there so that you don't um, maybe get too muddy of a sound. So you have to sort of keep that in mind. Whereas omnidirectional microphones do not exhibit any, any sort of um, artificial proximity effect there. So this just sort of compares um, uh, the most common uh, polar patterns out there. Um, again, omnidirectional cardioid being the most popular. When you start hearing about things like supracardioid, uh, that means that uh, it's even more directional. So as you move from cardioid to supracardioid to hypercardioid, um, the off-axis rejection gets more dramatic. So you get less unwanted sound and more desired sound. But you do have to make sure that the person using the microphone is aware of this and stays on mic so that they don't get get too far off and then the, the pickup suffers. And then finally we end up at the bi-directional response. Right. Oh, also the rear lobe. Yes. As you get more directionality, you also got to make sure that uh, people stay out of your directly 180 because you get more pickup when you get more directionality in front of the mic. You also tend to get more directionality behind the mic. That's correct. As yeah. you see that progression makes sense when you finally get to bi-directional and then it's equal equal pickup in both the zero and the 180 directions. But when you get to hypercardioid, people know, oh, I got a great really directional microphone, you also got a big lobe on the 180. Correct. Yeah, hypercardioid mics tend to be almost bidirectional. They're not quite, but they get close. The, tra the, the benefit, again, is much greater rejection as you get closer to like 90 degrees, but again, you do have that area of pickup in the back. And then, of course, like you said, bidirectional being equal pickup at the front and the back. And then finally, we talk about frequency response here, which is really just how the microphone sounds. Um, and that can be sort of charted out like we see it here on a graph that, you know, we look at uh, frequency uh, across the bottom here, the range of human hearing, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, versus output response of the microphone. And so when we talk about something having flat frequency response, what we basically mean is that for any given frequency that we put into the microphone, the output of it is pretty much uniform or flat across the entire range. And this is the kind of frequency response that is possible with a condenser microphone. All condenser microphones don't necessarily have this flat of frequency response, but it can be achieved with a condenser microphone, not so much with a dynamic microphone. And this is good. Now, you might look at this and think, well, this is perfect, right? Isn't this what you always want? Well, not, necess not necessarily, because not everything that you choose to record can reproduce across the entire audible range. If you're recording a grand piano, you're doing um, more ensemble recording like a, like a you know an orchestra or a choir or something like that, then yes, you might want this full, flat, natural frequency response. This is also something that you would want when you're uh, further from the sound source. Having this flat response to capture more of its naturalness is usually desired. But for up-close mic techniques, particularly on instruments or voices that don't cover the whole frequency range, having some sort of a shaped frequency response can act Actually be helpful, particularly when we're talking about recording the human voice. For example, if you're doing a podcast or an interview or something like that, um, very few humans can produce much energy below 100 hertz unless you happen to be the bass singer in a gospel choir or something like that. But what does happen down there is uh, rumble, wind noise, stage noise, vibration, pickup, things that are undesirable. So if you have a microphone that automatically starts to roll off below 100 hertz, that's actually a benefit because it eliminates those uh, um, those sounds that you may not want or that are actually going to muck up the recording. So that can be useful. And some boost or increased output from the microphone is also beneficial because uh, particularly when we're talking about intelligibility, the frequency range between 2K and 5K is where most of the consonant sounds that actually allow us to be understood 
occur. So a little bit of a boost or a little bit of shape there um, can actually help. Uh, same thing with musical instruments like um, snare drum or electric guitar. Um, this range is actually very important to helping define the sound of it, so a little bit of extra output there can be useful. So really, they're just two different tools, um, and you have to choose the right one based on what it is that you are trying to record in terms of its frequency response. So let's get into some sort of um, specific applications here. Uh, I might actually ask Thomas for a little bit of input on what, what kind of things do you look for, starting with the speech and maybe podcasting type application. What things do I look for? Um, well, speech intelligibility, basic reproduction. Uh, but again, what above that I look for is I like set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of a microphone. A proximity, of course, is everything. That's not necessarily true just for podcasting, but um, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the microphone design here, I think what we're looking at is a condenser microphone in this application. It is. Correct? It's a small diaphragm, small diaphragm cardioid condenser mic. Okay, cool. So I definitely, for speech and podcasting, you don't want an Omni. Probably not. Unless Especially if it's sitting right next to your computer there, right? Right. Like I can hear your computer making all sorts of noise right mm -hmm. now. It's got a huge fan in it. Yep. It's very loud. Uh, so directionality would help. I can't imagine that you would ever want an Omni for podcasting, but of course there's situations where you could. So a cardioid or a super cardioid or a directional microphone. Mm -hmm. um, something like you said before with maybe a, a little shaped frequency response that was optimized for vocals would mm -hmm. be good. Mm -hmm. I know podcasters like to have mute buttons mm. or what do they call those? Cough cough buttons, I think. Right, so. right. When you're doing an interview, yep. General recommendations, as you think of, too, in terms of placement, is about, you know, 12 inches or so from the mouth, you know. Not too much further than that, because, again, then the room starts to come into the equation too much if it's a noisy room. Uh, and also, when we talked about that proximity effect earlier, right, if you get too close to the microphone, suddenly you start sounding muddy and not maybe as clear. So general sort of placement recommendations for this application are a little bit further away as well, I think, generally sort of speaking here. I don't think a stereo microphone is your friend, generally, in a podcasting situation, because it's going to pick up more of the room. Right. Right. Cool. And then another speech application might be uh, for an interview. I know one choice here uh, might be the lavalier-type mm -hmm. microphone, right? Uh, which, in this case, um, you know, it... Uh, what are we looking at here? Is this an Omni or a cardioid pattern microphone? This is an Omni. Okay. Good. And that works well for interview because then, again, with this application, you don't necessarily know uh, where you're going to um, be able to put the microphone, depending right. on what the person is, is wearing and uh, how much you want the microphone to be seen or not seen. Um, so an Omni is usually used for interview applications in speech, whether you're watching uh, newscasters on television or somebody recording a podcast interview or what. I always recommend a lav mic as a first choice for anybody just because... Rule number one is the closer the mic is to the source, the better it's going to sound, no matter what your situation is. So if you can get the mic, you know, three to five inches from the mouth, that's going to be great. The Omni is effective in situations like this. Well, for instance, if you're giving a lecture or if you're in a exhibition hall, you're definitely going to hear the speaker above the environment. But you will get a nice bleed of the environment that gives you a sense of where you are. Um, you can hear the audience a little bit, or you can hear the trade show floor a little bit, mm -hmm. but you're definitely going to hear the speaker first and foremost in the audio mix. Because like we said, it's closer to their mouth. Because it's closer to their mouth, right. exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's always a good point. And again, the great thing about this is the... The, if the, the person you're interviewing, the talent, is not familiar with microphone technique, they can't get away from the microphone. That's right. Right? You can always tell when you're listening to a podcast if someone's, they're not using lavalier mics, they're using a tabletop or a desktop mic, and the sound starts to sound a little bit more like this kind of a thing because they're... It's they, a little off axis. Yeah, they don't know to stay on the mic or they kind of lean back, way back in their chair, and it, the sound starts to change somewhat dramatically. So you kind of overcome all of those issues if you just put the mic right on them. Or they turn their head to talk or look at something, yeah, Omni's going to take care of that. What's going on with this connector here on this one? That's uh, not the typical mic connector I'm used to seeing, and it's not a lightning right. or a USB connector either. I've heard that called a lot of different things. <laughs> uh, eighth inch, 3.5, TRRS, 4-pin, I've heard it called 4-pin recently. You know, it looks like what you had on your headphones or what you ha might have on your, yeah, on your earbuds, right, that go into your device, your smartphone, your tablet. Uh, if you're 
one of those people who has headphones or earphones that have an inline microphone, you will recognize the four pin perhaps because that fourth pin is for the microphone. Mm -hmm. So it, the more common connector is a TRR, sorry, the TRS, which TRS, what is it? It's tip, ring, ring, sleeve. That's what it stands for. So uh, a tip ring sleeve has a tip and a ring and a sleeve. Uh, the, even the more simple is the tip and sleeve, which I think is what you see on basically quarter-inch instrument cables, right. just a tip and a sleeve. And uh, tip ring ring sleeve refers to the four different sections that you have there. So hmm. more of an electric. Interesting. So. so in this case, with this microphone, we're not actually digitizing the signal first. This is taking advantage of the internal. It is. Uh, digitization of the device itself. And it's right. the, the, the four-pin configuration is basically so that it can go into a smartphone or an iPhone, and the pin configuration will be correct to what that device expects to see. Um, but you are correct as we are leaving the analog to digital conversion up to the smartphone or the tablet or the iDevice, and those are definitely band limited and sort of an afterthought, and they apply all sorts of other things that, like automatic gain control, you know, because mm -hmm. they're in charge of that. Yeah. So, but for speech, it's definitely an effective, quick and easy solution. And uh, I think the reason we did this one is because it's just people have been asking for it. And a lot of people use uh, iDevices and tablets to record speech and lectures. And the, the it's biggest... good enough for that. <laughs> absolutely. The yeah. biggest benefit you get is proximity because, it, you know, unless you want to hold your smartphone or your tablet in front of your mouth, you know, for the duration of your speech or lecture, um, you're going to get, you're going to put it down on the desk and then you're going to be a foot or two away from it and then you're going to get a lower quality of audio because you're going to get more room. Cool. But you could, if you wanted, if you had your own lavalier microphone that was a traditional XLR type condenser microphone, you could run through an interface of some sort. Absolutely. So moving on to applications here, but there on, on top of the guitar case here, you see one of those types of interfaces. That's the Shure MVI, which has phantom power and an XLR connector. And you could, if you wanted a little higher quality, get one of those you know, regular lavalier microphones and run it through an interface like that. Um, so here we're basically seeing two ways to approach sort of the same thing, depending on whether or not on the left you already own a nice condenser microphone that you like to use for your vocal applications, um, and you, you don't want to have to buy a new microphone. Then you just get the interface. You make sure the interface has phantom power. In this case, it goes right to the iPad, um, which is kind of a cool thing about the MVI. Um, a lot of them are just USB or FireWire only, but in the case of the MVI, it'll actually do both. Mm -hmm. Right? right, so you can run to whichever whatever device it happens to be, and whatever microphone you happen to have, and that works well. Um, on the right, of course, this is uh, the MV51, uh, which uh, is built in with um, the uh, digital conversion for you, and again, uh, right to the laptop. In this case, right. could go right to the iPad or the iPhone or Android device. Or yeah, on the, on the left, the MVI is our single channel interface. It's you know an analog to digital interface. Uh, the added benefits that it has is that it's also MFI, so it's got a cable that makes it do what it does for a USB host with an iOS host. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. basically working with Android, Mac, PC, iOS devices. Any and of that stuff. It's for, it's for anything, and it's basically if you need to get one channel of audio into one of those devices, this is the way to do it with a high-quality preamp and analog-digital um, converter. Mm -hmm. and and the combo jack, so it can take a quarter-inch instrument or uh, an XLR oh, input. Cool. And if you have your own microphone, a lot of people right. already have really good analog microphones. They just need a way to get it into a digital box. Yeah. Technique-wise, you'll notice that we're a little bit closer than you might be for the speaking application, um, and that again partially could you know be you want a more direct sound and less of the room to capture your voice clearly. And also, again, with the directional microphones, these are both directional microphones here. Um, in a vocal application, you like to take advantage of that proximity effect and that little bit of bass boost kind of warms the sound up makes your voice sound a little bit fuller all that good all that good stuff so you know about six six to eight inches or so is kind of more of a typical sort of thing often employing uh particularly with condenser microphones maybe an external windscreen or pop filter might be necessary to reduce p pops and that sort of stuff but that's fairly typical ways to approach uh, the vocal singing application uh, and then uh, the solo instrument application, um, again, same thing, you know, you probably want a decent sort of maybe condenser microphone, depending on what you're uh, recording, although sometimes for electric guitar and stuff, if you're running through an amp, um, you like the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
dynamic type of microphone. Um, or maybe you go to Thomas's point, you go direct. Again, these things have a quarter inch input on it. If you want to record your guitar sound uh, directly into the inst into the uh, device, um, the the MVI will allow you to uh, to do that. And uh, and and you know, with the amount of post processing you can do in these devices, if, you know, particularly like in this application with electric guitar, most people right. don't listen to an electric guitar recorded directly off the instrument, but you record right. it that way dry into your iPad and then apply uh, guitar amplifier modeling effects later on or whatever, and you end up getting the sound that you want. So uh, you can kind of go either way here. Yeah, well, the MVI is a great mic. It can withstand being put in front of a guitar amp just fine if you want to go ahead and record. The MV51? Your, I'm sorry, yeah. the MV51. You can go ahead and put that in front of your guitar amp and run that into your recording application. But um, in many cases, we found out, um, people don't have a situation, let's say, uh, where they can, let's say you're in your bedroom and your mom's downstairs, and you really can't turn that amp up. So a lot of people like to use uh, the MVI or use something that can just get the clean guitar directly into there. The MVI sounds great because it's a, it's a Class A uh, buffered preamp uh, it sounds good on its own, but what it really lets you do is take advantage of all the guitar modeling that's in these digital audio applications, GarageBand and whatnot, that make your guitar sound like anything you want it to with any <laughs> kind of pedal in the world and uh, Amplitube and whatnot, those things that people use nowadays, which basically gives you a whole, uh, a whole plethora of amplifiers and pedals mm -hmm. without the added benefit of the volume in your right. bedroom. Right. And again, to, just to drive the point home, there's really no way to connect your guitar directly to your iPad without something like this. Right. There's no, there's no uh, instrument jack <laughs> on a mobile device. Not really. yet that I've yeah. seen. On a quarter-inch input, I don't seem to be putting on in the near future just because the devices keep getting smaller. Yeah. One thing we haven't talked about yet, but since it's a good shot of it here, I'll, 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 I'll let you expound on this a little bit, is this mode button that you see right in the middle here with little symbols around it. What's that section for? Well, I'll tell you, when you get into the guitar, we leave we leave the modes aside. So if you're actually going to plug in a, an instrument like a guitar or a keyboard, what you basically get is a monitor on-off toggle with the MVI. And um, with a XLR, when it senses an XLR, then it gives you the same five speech modes that are in the MV51, which is one that's optimized for speech or podcasting, one that's optimized for singing. That's a speech bubble with a musical note inside of it. One that says acoustic, which is basically optimized for acoustic instruments. And then a loudspeaker that's it's supposed to indicate uh, loud sources, like an amplifier okay. or a really loud stage. And then the bar at the bottom indicates flat, which is no processing. So the other uh, four processing include basically like a, maybe a de in the speech, um, a, a little bit of a limiter and a compressor, and then an audio, uh, sorry, a, a frequency response curve that's tailored for that application. There might be a little like mid suck out on the uh, acoustic mode and then a little presence peak for the speech in the uh, singing mode, um, that sort of thing. It's, it's kind of built in under the hood. It's not, um, I would say, over the top. So we're not trying to color the sound a lot, but it's basically there to handle uh, what that application might include. Cool. and kind of optimize for things that you would do in post-processing if you're not the sort of person that's familiar with post-processing. That's mm -hmm. all. And if you are, that's why we give you the flat. Right. So if you don't want any DSP, go flat, and then you can do whatever you like later. But, right. yeah. Cool. If you'd like to play in post. Excellent. Now when we talk about um, ensemble recording, again, uh, there's a couple different ways to approach the ensemble, but we're, we're assuming that you're trying to maybe capture um, you know, the, a, a singing group or an acoustic band, or maybe you're just trying to record your song ideas as your band is working on it and you don't want to set up a whole ton of microphones. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can do this, but a, a very simple um, technique that people like to employ using stereo, two microphones is a stereo mic technique. Um, so what, what you're looking at here is the, the MV88, which is, uh, despite its tiny size, it doesn't look so tiny on the right, but if you look at the, on the table here left, it's not, you know, kind of connects directly via lightning connector to your iOS device there, you're getting um, a stereo microphone. What technique are we using here? Uh, to achieve our... To achieve the stereo. Throw me the softball recording. today. This yeah. is nice. Well, okay. so a lot of products on the market are XY, and this is an MS, which is... Um, 
which is the only other stereo microphone in the Shure portfolio mm. to date, uh, the predecessor being the VP88, um, which is also a mid-side microphone. It retails for about $1,000, and it's a foot and a half long. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> right. So, and it's got a five-pin XL. I think it's got a five, the five-pin mm -hmm. with the XLR snake on the end of it or the Medusa. It's a great microphone, but it's also really not intended for any applications like this. So this is what's nice about the mid-side uh, architecture is that by using two capsules, in this conjunction, which is to say a uh, front-firing cardioid that's at the end of that barrel and then a side-firing bidirectional that's facing the left and right sides in conjunction with one another, we can achieve a variable stereo width, uh, which you can select, and then we can also individually select for different applications each of those capsules individually, the cardioid or the bidirectional. And you can also output raw mid-side, which is to say the signals from each of those capsules separately. And then for someone who, again, likes to process in post and do their own stereo matrixing. Hmm. So it's very, very versatile. Okay, good. Yeah, the thing I like personally about the mid-side is that it's completely mono-compatible as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, unlike uh, XY, where the theory behind XY stereo miking is two cardioid mics, get as close as possible as they can to minimize any sort of phase issues. But that's, you know, you, you can't have two things physically occupy the same space. Right. So an XY technique will never be completely mono compatible. Um, but with the uh, with this MS type mic mid side, again, if you if you do end up with mono, the, the bidirectional capsule just cancels itself out and you're left with just the mid uh, or the cardioid pattern capsule, so it's completely mono compatible. And then again, either directly as you're trying to capture the recording or in post production later, you can adjust the width of that stereo image. With XY, the only way to really do that is to physically move the microphones to adjust the width of the stereo image you're picking up. Mid side uh, kind of accounts for that. So, again, a good condenser stereo mic placed at a distance is a great way to capture that natural sound of the ensemble itself. Um, and that type of microphone is also good, maybe more for the uh, field, field recording. recording absolutely, yeah, because of its size. I get this one. We did limit it a little more in terms of its uh, platform base. Like this is not a Mac <laughs> or a PC. Uh, it does have that lightning connector on it. It's not going to work on Android. It's only for iDevices. We did this because we saw the technology trend being that a lot of people that want to do capturing and editing of audio and video are doing so on these sorts of devices. And there was really no good front end that allowed you to do this. Um, and the other the thing is people support, people do video just as much as they do audio on these devices. So this allows you to get, arguably, stereo is perhaps even more important in video applications because there is a visual content that does correspond to a left and right field. And so you can have a more compelling end product if there is audio that corresponds to what you're seeing visually. And I think that's a good point um, to make maybe about the MV88 just in particular is that um, we, we have a, a recording app that you can get to use with any of these microphones. Um, but when you plug something like the MV88 into your iPhone, any recording app or, or your video capture that you happen to be doing uses that microphone. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's the, the beauty of the iOS ecosystem is if you... <clears throat> Uh, design your product and work with Apple to design your product to meet their uh, requirements of their ecosystem, uh, then you are plug and play, which is to say you plug into any app that records audio or video uh, and have our mic in as the uh, external device, it will light up and it will be recognized. So whether you're using the camera's native, sorry, the iPhone or iPad's native camera app, or any third-party audio or video app, our mic becomes that device. And so once you make the settings in our mic in our app in that MV88, uh, they are retained through whatever app you end up doing your uh, capture in, ultimately. Perfect. And then on the right there, you see a picture of the uh, AMV88 Fur, um, which is the uh, uh, Rycote uh, windscreen that we have available for the MV88. The outdoor recording I made earlier uh, wasn't a very windy day, so I didn't have a need for such a thing, and it sounds pretty good. But you got a lot lucky. of I got lucky. You got lucky. Yeah. yeah. Plus, I was close to the building too. I would say to any anybody well, anybody that does any field recording understands the need to protect your microphone with some sort of furry. Uh, Rycote are the people that actually invented that. I think they got it 
a Grammy. No, it's not a Grammy. What are the ones they give away for motion pictures? An Oscar. They got an Oscar a couple decades ago when they came up with that, but um, they recognize that wind actually breaks up the low-frequency information that occurs from wind. Uh, so we we does, we work with them to make a furry for this but if you know with these condenser microphones they're extremely sensitive i mean it, with this 88 honestly if you even start making hand motions with it and waving it around your hand you're going to pick up pick that up it's an extremely sensitive microphone yeah so there's a windscreen kind of a foam windscreen that's included with the mic this is an accessory that again any sort of outdoor recording highly recommend so foam like is great that. for plosives right and then this is ideal for wind Okay, so there's a, kind of a family shot of some of the mics we've been talking about there in the new uh, Motive lineup. Um, we also have, uh, for people who have been around for a while, the X2U, uh, which is still a currently available product that um, is XLR to USB uh, converter device as well, um, similar to the MVI but without the quarter-inch input on it and the different mode settings and such. Yeah, um, there's a couple. I mean, I'd say the big one is that it's... Um 16-bit 44.1 mm. uh, sample rate, right? Uh, whereas the MV, the Motive stuff is all 24-bit 48K. Okay. Um, and the other thing in terms of the MVI, which is it's it's the direct ancestor of the MVI. It, it only does XLR, and the MVI does XLR or quarter inch. Mm. Um, the third thing that is different is that it is not iOS. So you this can't is USB a, only. USB only, so yeah. it's not iOS. So that's the third big thing. They both have onboard monitoring. However, um, there is a blend which you see on that little monitor. There's a picture of a computer and a microphone which allows you to blend the audio coming back with the audio going in. That actually got some people lost. It's sort of an advanced <laughs> feature. So on the MVI that's always set to a 50-50 split. Mm. Yeah, good point. And there are bundles, too, with include either the SM57 with the X2U or the SM58 with the X2U. Um, so just a, just yet another option out there for, um, for a USB recording. So that brings us uh, pretty close to the end here. Uh, I do want to mention there is a PDF document uploaded into the webinar that you can download, which is our Introduction to Home Recording and Podcasting Educational Book, which goes into all of these topics in much more detail. So please, please feel free to download that, or you can get it later from the SHURE website. Um, again, as Cheryl mentioned, you can view archived versions of all of our old webinars at SHURE.com slash training. If you'd like to get notifications for future webinars, you can go to SHURE.com slash subscribe and uh, get notification. Um, and our next webinar is going to be on October 18th, and that's going to be Microphone Techniques for Theatrical uh, Performances, which should be a good topic. But with the few minutes we have remaining, I want to see if there's any questions out there that we might be able to field. There are a couple. Uh, there are some all-in-one recording devices like Zoom. Can you speak to those at all? Well, I think one of the things maybe Thomas might have more input than I do is that you're sort of you're locked into that device and those microphones, and you don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of choice as far as um, you know what kind of applications you like to record with, uh, what sort of microphones you might want to record with, things like that. It's very it's a it's a it's a fixed ecosystem, I guess. What is the f I'm sorry, Zoom? Zoom, yeah, like the Zoom recorders or oh, right. yeah. Okay. Or Tascam, I, mean, I believe, makes some. Well, Zoom makes a lot of products, right? Mm -hmm. I think they were they're out of Japan now. Maybe they're part of Roland. They're they're uh, they're they are they're some good products, right? They've definitely made a name for themselves in the terms of the portable handheld field recorders, right? Like the Zoom H4n is very popular, and they've done a couple of different ones. One with the interchangeable head, I think that's the H6. Those are great standalone products. Uh, I'm not going to knock them. The one thing I'd say is that. In terms of, it's got, it's, they generally have a lot more features on them. They're a lot more expensive than any one of our individual Motive products. Uh, they have things like XLR inputs and things like that. The one thing you have to do is media transfer. And I think the way the technology trend going is like, if you have to take an SD card out of something and put it into something else and transfer your media, it takes time. And um, it's something that a lot of people just don't feel like doing. So that one of the things, the advantage you have is if you capture on an iOS device, which is basically a flash drive itself, or capture directly on your computer, you're just one step closer to editing what you have. Um, in terms of the 88, the Zoom did make, I think, the only other mid-side competitor that's out there which is, I think, the Zoom IQ6. Uh, it's not bad, but it is, it's $50 cheaper, and it is also entirely plastic. So there's a build quality issue there. Mm -hmm. It is the only other one that supports um, video. 
Yeah. yeah. A lot of what I think it again comes down to for me is like, you know, you've already got this thing that you spent several hundred dollars on your phone, your iPad, whatever it is, right? right. And you want to add something on it to be able to record with that device. And any of these microphones allow you to do at least as good of a job, if not better, than some of those sort of all in one devices. Some people like purpose built things. I like I just want a recorder and I don't want it to do anything else and that's all fine and and good. Um, but again the, the flexibility of taking advantage of the technology you already have and just adding a microphone to it, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Cool. All right, and then one last question and it's sort of a hot button topic, so <laughs> you've been getting softballs Thomas. Here's here's your tough one. Uh, are there any plans to do an NV88 like Mike for Android? Android? Yeah, we love that question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this as simple as I can. Uh, so when we started working on these microphones, Android was not supporting USB audio, right? So if you're not going to have a platform that supports USB audio, you can't make a product for that. Um, about midway through the development of Motive, they did come out with a IO, uh, an OS release that supported USB audio. It's called, I think that was Lollipop. Um, but there are so many Android devices out there that your mileage may vary on how well that works. Um, and I can't speak to terms of product roadmap, but I am happy to see that the Android ecosystem is sort of um, giving more support for USB audio and USB audio devices. What I say to people right now, the solution is, um, there's a really great audio app called uh, USB Audio Recorder Pro. It's like a single channel, I think. And then there's a more fully featured digital audio workstation. It's called Audio Evolution. Uh, and we've talked to those folks. They're out of the Netherlands. They're on Google Play. They're highly rated. Th what they did was they wrote their own USB audio driver, which is far better than the native Android driver, and using their app, you can do fully featured recordings like you could if you were a GarageBand user on iOS. And with that, with their app, um, our microphones work just fine. Uh, that is to say the MVI, the MV51, and the MV5, and the MVL, right? The only thing that doesn't right now is that 88. So we'll see. All right. Um, which Shure mic is recommended for voice recording to break into the voiceover industry? The SM7B. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> oh, but he said motive mic. Oh, ah. motive mic. Um, you know what? I have heard great things out of the five. It just depends on what your budget is. The five or the 51 are going to both be great. Um, one is a small diaphragm. One is a large diaphragm. I've heard such good results out of the five that I really don't think people need to go further. What I would say is that um, the interface that you're paying for on the 51 is a little more elegant. And like one feature that people like to have is that cough button. Frankly, the the mute. cough button, the mute on the back of the five is a is a it's plastic mute. button. It's a physical button, and it's going to make a click. When you knew, you know, so unless you want to edit those out, I would say go for a 51 because it's got this cap touch panel that's an industry first and it allows you to make noiseless, seamless adjustments uh, such as mute. Awesome. Great. And last question What mic was used for this webinar? <laughs> <laughs> the same ones we use for every webinar, which is the SM58. So, with and uh, well, and that's really not to do with the microphone, but to do with what you want to do with it afterwards. Was Gino's got these all running into a what this is over here? SCM820 automatic mic mixer. So yeah. the, the reason for that is because all three of us are sitting in the same room. So we could have had three individual computers with an MV mic plugged into each one of them, um, but you wouldn't have the advantage of the auto mixing, which means when I'm talking and Cheryl and Thomas aren't, their mics would pick me up too, and that would sound bad on the so phone. Are there any plans so. for an iOS auto mixing app? <laughs> Good idea. Yes, we're in a little bit more of an advanced setup here. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you had a question that you didn't, didn't get a chance to ask or something that comes up later, and it doesn't have to be regarding this, it can be regarding any sort of audio or microphone t uh, question, um, you can send that to support at sure.com, and we'd be more than happy to answer it. Um, so we want to thank you so much for joining us today, and hopefully we will see you next month.